these chapters are, are going to build on one another. And because they do that, there's a lot of uh, repetition with vocabulary. So if you're, looking, if you're looking at your study guides, you may see the same terms uh, on different chapters just because we'll be using those going forward. And so this first chapter is really just introducing ecology. And then um, 45 is really where we'll get into sort of the meat of how you do these types of studies, how you study populations, how you study communities. Um, so we'll do a lot more sort of graphs and interpretation of data and things like that in the next chapter. So 44 is just kind of an overview of what ecology is and how we, how we sort of ask the broad questions at the different levels of organization. So um, I like this intro uh, frame from the textbook about deer ticks, uh, a bullseye rash, and a white-footed mouse. So what is the connection here? Does anybody know without looking at the <laughs> or you can look. Lyme disease, right? So this is a good introduction to ecology because it's all about interactions, right? And there's someone who's missing from this, these three frames. If you had to add a frame to this discussion to put another picture of another organism, can you guess who it might be? Deer, hmm? yeah. So it's really an interesting story with Lyme disease. I could get into it in a ton of detail, but what happens is basically the tick is the vector. It carries a bacterium that causes Lyme disease in humans. This bullseye rash is sort of a diagnostic um, characteristic of somebody who's been bitten by a tick who's carrying this uh, particular bacteria that can cause Lyme disease. But this dude is the host, the primary host that incubates the bacteria. So this guy bites this guy, and this guy um, incubates, right? And then another one feeds on this guy, and then might get onto a deer. So the deer is kind of the secondary host. Uh, it's actually more important what the population of the deer mice looks like rather than the deer themselves, because these guys are the ones that are really causing the incubation of the bacteria. So higher number of the bee guys means higher number of bee guys, and if they're carrying that bacteria, it means more Lyme disease for people. Okay, so really the point here is that it's interaction between multiple organisms. So no organism lives in a vacuum, right? It doesn't matter. If you're talking about prokaryotes, or if you're talking about if you're talking about um, mammals like us, right? Or if you're talking about reptiles, it doesn't matter. Nobody lives alone. We're always surrounded, right, by other organisms, and we're interacting with them all the time. So this is a nice sort of uh, broad scale interaction between multiple species um, that affect all of them ultimately. So that's kind of the idea with ecology is the study of how living organisms interact with each other and their environments. Pretty straightforward, right? Have you guys studied ecology before? In high school or otherwise? Yeah, not so much? Okay. Well, um, I think you'll like it. So some examples of what we look at in ecology include things like resource acquisition and allocation. What do those words mean, you may ask, right? So what does it mean to acquire something? To get it right to go gain it to get it so you how do you get your resources where do you get them from do you have to compete for them right that's acquisition and then do you guys know what allocation means say again to to sort of yeah so you said to get out or to distribute um it also like if you're allocating something you are sort of portioning it right you're sort of before you distribute it you have to decide who gets what so if i want to like give you guys 100 points of bonus but I'm gonna distribute it equally, I have to allocate it first, right? So to count how many and then divide by however many are here, right? And then distribute. So allocation means like how much of each, how much of a whole do I give to each portion of the problem, right? So resource allocation refers to once I have acquired resources, what do I do with them? How much of my resources that I've gained do I spend on uh, further acquisition of resources? How much of that do I spend on reproduction? How much of that do I spend on migration, right? So it's sort of like looking at what organisms do with the resources that they gain, okay? So we'll talk about that. Um, species distribution and abundance. So we're talking about um, distribution means where do you find certain species? So what's their range? Where are they native? Where are they introduced? Are they potentially invasive in their, in their in introduced range? So questions like that. Um, abundance, do you guys know what abundance means? Mm 
more how much do you have really yeah it, it, it usually means you have more than you need if you have abundant resources or abundant money or abundant food or abundant friends you have a ton right but abundance in terms of species means basically how much is it how abundant are they right that's sort of how we use the term in ecology um, human health in the natural world that definitely gets in to talking about um, interactions, just like with our Lyme disease example that we started off with. So those are just some of the topics that we'll cover when we're talking about ecology, but it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, it's also a really broad field. So you're integrating things like biochemistry. Those of you who have been working on water quality can attest to that, right? The chemicals that are present in the water affect what? Deb, you guys are doing water quality. What would you say would be one thing that water chemicals in the water can affect? Like the water, like, like fish and stuff. Yeah, what's, what lives there, right? Because things that live in the water are going to be using the resources that are available. So measuring those indicates, you know, what are the things that what they're doing with them? How are they doing? It can affect their health. It can affect their reproductive rates, all those types of things. Um, so chemistry is involved. Physiology. What's physiology? Do you know? Do you remember? Function, yeah. So how do how do things work physically? Um, evolution, of course, is always going to be the foundation of any question that you ask in biology. So we can talk about the evolution of species relationships, right, within and between um, different groups. Biodiversity, of course. What is biodiversity? We've all been working on it in some form or other since the beginning of this semester with our projects. What's biodiversity? Okay, yeah. yeah. Diversity of yeah, diversity of living organisms in an ecosystem. How, who's there, right? Do you have a lot of species in a, in a particular ecosystem or do you have just a few, right? So those are the types of things that we can look at with um, diversity. Molecular biology, we're talking about DNA and RNA, right? So you can do molecular ecology. If you are interested in looking at um, something like population genetics, that would fall right under ecology, molecular ecology. So that's involved. What about geology? What's geology? Yeah, you know? yeah. Rocks and minerals, the earth essentially, right? So earth processes, um, the movement of tectonic plates, right? We'll talk about biogeography here in just a few minutes and what that means. Um, soil chemistry, all of these things are gonna fall into ecology as well. And climatology, what's climatology? What do you guys think? Studying what? Yeah. So long-term weather patterns, shifts in those weather patterns, things like that. So um, you can see that there's a lot, right, that comes together in ecology. So you, what you really end up with is this really cool sort of amalgamation of all the things, um, looking at how things work together, which brings us full circle right back up to the top of this slide that says how organisms interact with each other and their environment, right? So it's all a big puzzle. And ecology sort of brings those pieces together. Um, frequently uses mathematical modeling. So you guys will see so many graphs. You'll see more graphs in these last four chapters than we've seen the whole semester because ecologists love to make models. So we model things like um, growth rates, birth rates and death rates, uh, population size changes, um, climate modeling. So we'll talk about lots of examples of that. You guys will look at tons of graphs. I know you can't wait, right, for graphs. Um, so the scope of ecology narrows, uh, ranges from narrow to broad, with organismal ecology being the most narrow and ecosystem ecology being the most broad. And we're gonna talk about the differences between those um, in this chapter. And then um, once we've had some time for it to sort of sink in, we'll do a Kahoot called Name That Ecology. And you'll actually tell me which of these four levels are you sort of working in and why. Okay, so we're gonna do that. And then on your exam, the final exam, which is three and a half weeks away from now, you'll have the opportunity to examine some case studies in ecology and tell me what are you working on? Are you working on organismal ecology or community ecology and why? Okay, so that's going to be different than anything you've seen on previous exams. So the only questions you'll see the whole semester that are not multiple choice. Okay, so you have to have to like write an answer, short answer. All right, so what are we talking about? What do you guys think organismal ecology is focused on? Organisms, yep, individual organisms. Um, population is going to be groups of the same species that interact with each other. 
community is multiple species that interact with each other, and then ecosystem brings in the uh, non living components of the, of the environment. So, we're going to look at that going forward. Before we do that, let's define these terms, okay, because it'll make it easier. So, we're looking at populations, communities, and ecosystems. So, a population includes all individuals of a particular species within a specified area. So, when you're talking about a population, um, it doesn't have to be all of the individuals of that species in the whole wide world. Right? In fact, it's usually not. So you're usually looking at a population within a defined area of space. Okay, so if we're talking about white pines in a forest, we, so let's say we're um, arborists and we're studying trees. Okay, we're gonna pick a particular forest in which to study this population of white pines. It doesn't mean we're looking for information or data on every single white pine tree in the entire world. Right, we're talking about those in this particular habitat, this particular ecosystem. So populations can be defined in lots of different ways. So you can um, insist that your population must be in a particular geographic region, right? So white pines of Canada, right? You could say white pines of uh, this 50 acre tract in one specific city in Canada. Right, so you kind of define what that population is, but you just have to be talking about all of the same species that can interact with one another. Does that make sense? What about the human population? Can you talk about the whole, all the humans in the entire world as the human population? You can, right? Um, when we do things like talk about the overall mortality rate of COVID-19, that's global, that's human population level, right? So you can be super broad if you want to, but if we wanted to ask, uh, let's say we wanted to do a survey of the number of um, people who visit the Carpenterville campus of Georgia Highlands College that have been vaccinated or planted, right? That's a much, much smaller population, but it's still a population because we're talking about all humans, right? Makes sense? So you kind of define the boundaries of your population that you're studying. As long as it's all the same species, you're still at the population level. When you go up to the community level, you're talking about different populations, but still in the same area. So if you were going to study this forest and you were trying to do community level ecology, you would take in the white pine trees, of course, because um, that's your focal species, but also other types of trees, flowering plants, insects, microbes, mammals, birds, it doesn't matter. Everyone right, belongs in the community. Um, so multiple species, but they're still interacting. They're still in the same defined geographic area. That's a community. Ecosystem, as I mentioned, brings in the non-living components, which we'll refer to as the abiotic or abiotic components of the community. So what does biotic mean? Living, yeah. So if you're talking about the biotic components, you're really talking about the community, right? You're talking about all the living things that are there. But when you start talking about abiotic or non-living components, you're talking about things like Soil nutrients, right? Minerals in the soil. Are those living or not living? Non living, but does it matter to the living things? Absolutely, right? Uh, what about rainwater? Living or non living? Non living. It's just H2O, right? But is it important for living things? Absolutely, right? What about weather? Like, mm, how much does it snow? How much does it rain in the spring? Living or not living? non-living, right? It's just weather patterns, but does it affect the community that lives there? So yeah, when you start talking about an ecosystem, you're still talking about all these other components, but you're adding in the non-living things that have a drastic impact on how those living things use their um, atmosphere. And then sort of the highest level of organization that we talk about is biosphere, and that is the earth plus part of the atmosphere. So all the land, all the water, and part of the, air, the, the parts of the atmosphere that living things use. So that's like large scale. So you can talk about ecosystem at the bio scale. A biosphere scale is just a huge scale, right? So that's what I mean by narrow to broad, okay? All right. So let's look at an example and sort of get a better grasp on what's going on from an ecological survey standpoint um, of these four levels. So if we're talking about organismal ecology, you're studying adaptation that allow individuals to live in their specific habitats. Okay, so you're looking at an organism and you're looking at things like morphology. What's morphology? 
physical structure, right? Shape, size, how it's put together, body fit, right? Um, physiological and adaptations, behavioral adaptations, that's all organismal type stuff. So our example that we're using here as we sort of move through these four levels is the Carter blue butterfly. Pretty, right? It's a nice butterfly. Um, it is threatened because of habitat destruction. Okay, so we'll talk a lot in this unit about those types of things, like how your how does how does your habitat and its vulnerability affect the, the vulnerability of population. Okay, so that's part of what we're talking about here. Carter blue butterfly females preferentially oviposit. Do you guys know what oviposition means? That's a new term, probably. Do you know what an ovum is? It's egg. Yeah. So ovum position is laying eggs. So we talk about uh, something like a lepidopter and like a butterfly that flies around and deposits eggs here and there. That's overposition, not over, over um, depositing eggs. Preferential overposition means what? What does it mean if you have a preference? Yeah, you choose something, right? This is where I'm going to overposit and this is where I'm not, right? So preferential overposition means that they are only going to lay their eggs on wild lupin, which is it. Okay, this flowering plant here in this picture. Um, because of this preference, this would be a behavioral adaptation of the female, right? Probably a physiological adaptation of the larvae, because when the larvae hatch out of those eggs, that's what they eat, is the plant that they're laid on, right? So that's why the Carter Blue chooses to lay her eggs on the wild lupin, because that's the food the caterpillars need when they hatch out, okay? So because of this tight relationship between the carter blue butterfly and the uh, um, wild lupin, the butterflies are dependent upon the presence of the lupin for survival of the species, okay? Are we talking about organismal biology and organismal ecology here, or are we talking about community? What do you guys think? Because we're looking at two different species, right? The butterflies and the lupin. So what do you think? Yeah. It's still only organismal because it's like a symbiotic relationship. And it's still excluding from the synthesis of the new substances. And it's how it mostly benefits one, not the other one. Yeah, so that makes it that, that makes a good point, right? Absolutely. So Michael says organismal. Anybody want to argue community? Could you? You could, right? So that's kind of my point. Um, it's all it's all like this. Right? So when you have a question that you see on an exam that asks you to analyze that, there's not really a wrong answer. As long as you give me, like Michael did, the explanation as to why you feel that way. Right? So you can, you can justify it, then I'll take it. Okay? As long as, I I'm, as long as I can see that you have an understanding of why you think that. Okay? You get the idea? So the reason that I sort of use this first introduction as an organism is because you can look at things like uh, the physiological adaptation of the caterpillar to only eat wild lupin leaves, right? So that would be organismal. Even though you're looking at the lupin as well, you're mostly focused on the biology of the caterpillar. Right, okay. So we're good with organismal. At the population level, again, that's members of the same species living in the same area at the same time. And sometimes, this is also key, you use interbreeding as your parameter for defining the population. So if you are interacting to the point where you can breed, right, you can mate and you can have offspring with others in that population. Okay, so sometimes you can define your population that way. Um, a term for the organisms within the population that you should probably be familiar with is conspecifics, okay? Meaning same species, within species. So conspecifics are organisms that are all members of the same species. That's just terminology. Okay, so we talk about conspecifics. Um, again, you can define a population however you want to. It can be defined by natural boundaries. It can be defined by artificial boundaries. So natural boundaries that separate populations, one from another would be things like rivers or a mountain range or a desert. But you can also have an artificial boundary like a mode field or roads, right? So once upon a time, when the college wasn't here and the Walmart wasn't here, there was probably contiguous forest from over here to over there, right? But now there's a huge highway and some college, a college campus and a Walmart. So now you've divided the forest. These trees over here are no longer connected to those trees over there behind like Roaming Road or whatever. 
You guys see what I'm saying? So sometimes it's natural boundaries that, that divide populations and sometimes they're man-made. And all those are legit, right? You're still using those as your boundaries. Um, population ecology studies demographics. So we'll talk about demographics quite a bit in the next chapter, which is basically uh, numerical studies of population changes. So things like birth rate, death rate, um, age at first reproduction, things of that nature. Um, and also how they change over time and why they change over time. So you don't just look at a population at every season and count them and go, here's your information. But you're also looking for reasons that those might be changing or reasons that they might be staying the same. Okay, so that's going to be population ecology. Um, yeah, the example I gave here would be counting numbers of butterflies. So if you wanted to do population size of current and blue butterflies on a particular uh, pine barren habitat from season to season, that would be population ecology. Make sense? Okay, um, let's see. Because butterflies depend on lupin, you could study density and distribution of the plant populations and the factors that influence their decline. So again, you could be getting into community ecology if you're talking about how these populations of plants change and how that affects the butterfly population. So then that's going up to community level. But if you just wanted to do population work on the lupin itself, you could do that too, right? Make sense? You guys with me on this? Okay. Just giving you some sort of examples of the types of questions that ecologists ask. Because it's so broad that I think it helps to sort of rein it in with a particular example and sort of start thinking about how you can ask these questions. Um, you guys have a distinct advantage, I feel like, because you started really early in the semester asking your own questions. And so you have some experience asking and answering ecological questions already. So I like that. I like that for you. Okay. Um, community ecology, again, no population lives in isolation. Everything interacts with something else. Um, the term for members of a community that are different species interacting is heterospecific. So you've got conspecifics, meaning same species, heterospecifics, meaning different species. Okay. Um, some examples in community ecology. I think, if I'm being honest, that community ecology is probably my favorite because it's some of the most interesting dynamics that we talk about in this unit. Things like predator-prey interactions. So what am I talking about with predators and prey? What is a predator? Yeah. Something that hunts to gain food. Yeah, something that hunts to gain food. Something that eats something else. What do they eat? Prey. Yeah. So predator-prey interactions are really interesting because there's this interplay. There's this co-evolution. Right, that goes on in between predator and prey. If you can get better, if you can adapt or evolve as a prey species to get um, to more effectively evade your predator or more effectively escape or more effectively hide from your predator, that's an advantage for you as the prey, right? So, in order to keep eating, what does the predator have to do? They have to hunt, but what if your prey item that you're hunting is getting better at hiding from you? You have to get better too, right? You have to get better at finding it. So there's this really interesting sort of evolutionary arms race that goes on with predator-prey interactions. If one gets better, the other one has to get better too, or you get, uh, you stop, or you get eaten to death, right? It's an extinction. So that's kind of cool. We'll look at that later uh, in more detail. Uh, symbiotic relationships are community ecology, and as you guys know, that's a super interesting topic, right? How things interact with one another at that really intimate level, right? Um, where two different species, or more than two different species, depend upon one another in some way. Um, so we'll talk about more specific examples of that going forward as well. Pollination. How is pollination community ecology? Who does it involve? Do you guys know? What's pollination? Yeah. It trans um, I'm sorry, it's the transfer of the pollen of one plant to another, hopefully fertilization. Yeah. Spread. It's kind of like a reproduction system. Absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Perfect way to word it. It's just spreading pollen from one plant to another in order for that plant to be able to reproduce. Um, if you're talking about a pollination, a plant that has a pollination strategy that depends on a pollinator, what are you talking about? Like, give me some examples of pollinators. Butterflies, bees, some birds, right? Bats, even flies. 
lots of different things, right? So um, pollinator, pollinate, let's see, pollinator plant relationships. I'm trying to see like how what would you call the pollinate? <laughs> I don't think that's a word. The so pollinator and plant relationships, right? Those are int intimate, ecological, uh, community level relationships. Herbivory, what's herbivory? You guys recognize that word at all or the root of it? Feeding plants. Yeah, so I like to think of herbivory as predator prey interactions, but with plants, right? Because you never really talk about plant, uh, plants that get eaten by grazers, for example, you don't really talk about that as predator and prey, but it kind of is. The only difference is the plant can't get away. But plants do stuff too, right, to defend themselves against predation or herbivory. Like what? What can plants do? Spikes, poisons. Spikes, poisons, right? Distasteful compounds, it just doesn't taste good, right? So things like that, yeah. We'll spend some time talking about that. And then competition. Competition is like the biggest one. When we first started talking about evolution in the first few chapters in this semester, which now feels like two years ago, doesn't it? Um, we talked about the three components of natural selection. And right? we had genetics and we had variation and we had competition, right? The fact that there are always more individuals that are born than the environment can support. The competition is huge in ecology. You can talk about uh, competition with conspecifics, so interspecies, intraspecies competition, right? Like uh, two birds competing for the same territory, right? That's competition. But you also have interspecies or heterospecific competition, right? Where you have, um, let's see, what's a better, another good example? Well, to use the same example, if you had conspecific uh, competition for, let's say, uh, Oh, okay, I got a good story. So on my back porch, we have a bluebird house. And every spring, bluebirds come and they nest in the house because they do that. Right? That's just how they that's their biology. But bluebirds, they look all cute and sweet, but man, they are mean if anybody comes near that house. Okay. So if another male bluebird tries to come to that to that house, guess what? The the papa bluebird that lives in that house already that has babies on a nest, but female has babies on a or eggs on a nest, he will fight that other bluebird. To defend his house. Okay, so that would be conspecific competition, right? Two bluebirds fighting. But um, there's another species of bird called European starlings. You have probably seen them everywhere. They're black and they're super numerous. You've definitely seen one if you don't know what you're looking at. But they also like to nest in boxes. They're not that much bigger. They can usually fit in the same size hole. And we have this starling that comes and is like poking his head in, and those bluebirds go nuts. When that starling comes, because now they're defending their territory. But that's heterospecific, because they're two different species of birds. Does that make sense? So that's just one small example of competition, but competition is everywhere and everything. Even in that nest where those eggs, those bluebird nests, those bluebird eggs are sitting right now. When they hatch, do you think there's competition between this, the hatchlings? Sure. What are they competing for? Food. Have you ever seen baby birds beg for food? They open their gaping mouths and they make a ton of noise, and it's like the loudest one, biggest mouth gets the most food, you know? So competition is everywhere. That's a huge part of community ecology. Um, so that brings us to the last bullet here, which is just summarizing community ecology, and that's studying interactions, the consequences of those interactions, and the forces they're driving. Okay, so that's going to be like I said, my favorite part of talking about ecology usually um, is community interactions, just because they're dynamic and interesting and complex and kind of cool. So anyway, that gets us to ecosystem ecology. Um, that's going to, again, include the biotic and abiotic components like air, water, soil, et cetera. The questions that you ask at the ecosystem level, at least how we're going to focus on it, are going to be involving energy flow and nutrients. Okay, so how, do you, how does energy move into and out of a system? And what happens to nutrients as they cycle through the system? So those are going to be mostly the things that you focus on when you're looking outside of just the living and you're bringing in the non-living components as well. Um, so to bring this whole story full circle and sort of summarize what's going on here, oak pine barrens, that's the habitat in which the wild lupin is native. Okay, it's called an oak pine barren because you can see the trees around the edges, right? Those are oaks and pines mostly. Um, and then this part is called a barren. Anybody guess why? You know what barren means? 
if your soil is barren, you heard that term before? Yeah, I mean, things don't really grow there. Maybe it's low in nutrients, maybe it's really dry. That's probably the case. Both of those are probably the case, and it's oak pine barren. But what happens here is that this is the natural state of this ecosystem. And there are certain uh, organisms, like the wild lupin, that are well adapted to this particular set of circumstances. In fact, this barren is dependent upon fire to maintain the balance of organisms that live here. So in some ecosystems, fire is important. And sometimes, because we as human beings don't like things to burn, why don't we like things to burn? We build houses, we put roads in, we don't want those things to catch on fire, and so we tend to suppress fire to keep things from burning down, right? Which makes sense. Um, but if you have something that is supposed to burn, ecologically speaking, you can actually change the entire makeup of an ecosystem by suppressing fire. And that's often what happens on these oak pine barrens. So every so often, whether it's yearly or every couple of years, sometimes you got a 10 year burn cycle um, that you could, it depends on the ecosystem. But let's say this depends on a fire every two years to come through. So naturally, a fire would start when it's dry and lightning starts. That's the number one most, most likely cause of a natural fire to start. It rips through this ecosystem and it burns everything off. Okay, that keeps those trees at bay because any seedlings of these oaks and pines that have moved into this barren habitat that have been able to sort of take root and seed in, they don't survive. They're not fire adapted, okay? But the wild lupin seeds are fine. So you can burn this thing to the ground and the lupin have put a seed bank into the soil that are just fine with fire. They're tolerant to it. And in fact, they require it because if you have trees and shrubs and things that are bigger, growing in and encroaching on this barren habitat, as they will in the absence of fire, they shade out the lupin. So the lupin seedlings, when they germinate, come up above ground, they're very small, they're herbaceous, they stay little and soft, they're not woody, right? So these larger trees are better at competing for sunlight than these lupin, yeah. What stops the fire now? Starts? Um, historically, in the absence of humans to come and spray with a hose, usually there's some sort of a natural fire break, like a river, or you run out of fuel, like the whatever substrate you have that fire bumps up against is not going to burn. So it, it, you can have fires that burn like wildfires, right? Which can be a lot of area, but eventually it'll stop. Or it'll rain, right? So it could burn for a month until it comes down raining. But yeah, historically, the earth would have burned a lot more in a lot more area than what we see now because we stopped it now. But yeah, there's lots of ways that it can sort of contain itself. Does that make, make sense? In the general sense, at least. All right, so the wild lupin need the fire to come through and clear out the species that are encroaching on the barren habitat that could potentially shade out the babies of the lupin, right? The seedlings of the lupin. So this habitat, in its pristine form, is dependent on fire. Okay, but again, we don't like things to burn, um, and there's development everywhere, right? So there's habitat like this in the United States. Um, very small, usually, preserves of it because you have to say, like, okay, don't build here. You're going to preserve this habitat. So let's say over the generations, we have been allowing this to, we haven't been allowing these barrens to burn. They're basically going to disappear because even in a barren like this, where the soil is not very rich and it's kind of dry, over time, the more stuff it has allowed to sort of creep in and grow in, when it dies and it drops organic material like leaf litter, um, or even dead, you know, tree trunks or whatever, they, they decompose and they make the soil rich. So they actually make it harder for the lupin to grow. Okay, because the lupin do fine with the nutrients, but so do the trees and shrubs. So the more nutritious the soil becomes, the more likely it is for those trees and shrubs to be able to continue moving in. And if they, they do that, they crowd out the lupin. You guys with me? Does that make sense? A lot of moving parts to this story, right? So if you don't have fire, which is, a, is, okay, good question. Fire, living or non-living? Non-living, right? Just fire. But without fire, you lose the habitat for lupin. Without lupin, what else do you lose? The butterfly, the kind of blue, right? So, ta-da, ecosystem ecology, right? Um, everything is interacting. Everything affects everything else. 
right? And so now at this point, we're talking about non-living factors that have a downstream effect, a trickle-down effect, all the way down to the butterflies themselves, which we started out with talking about organismal ecology half an hour ago. All right? So that's a long story about the butterflies, but it introduces a lot of the components of ecology that we're going to be talking about in the next three chapters after this one. You guys good? All right. Cool. Let's switch gears and talk about a few of the topics from this chapter that you guys would be responsible for understanding. And the first one is biogeography. And we have talked about biogeography before, but it's been a while. Again, two years ago, beginning of the semester. Right, we talked about biogeography um, in terms of uh, evidence of evolution. Right? And we looked at a, a range map of a particular family of plants for the AC, I think it was. We talked about how you can use the range of an organism to, to put together the clues about its evolutionary history. Right, so that's where we've introduced this before. So you've seen the term. But what we're talking about here is um, more specifically because we're not tying it directly to evolution, we're just talking more specifically about where do you find these organisms. So biogeography in terms of uh, ecology is the study of geographic distributions of the species. Where is it? Right? That's what we mean by geographic distribution and the abiotic factors that affect that distribution. Okay, so where do you find things and why do you find them there? Um, abiotic factors like temperature and rainfall both non-living, right? But they both affect the living things, right? If you have a, a place on the earth that is uh, really, really cold all the time, like Antarctica, how's that going to affect the things that live there? Are there a lot of things that live in Antarctica? You guys know anything about Antarctica? Where is Antarctica? South Pole, right? Not a ton of biodiversity on the South Pole, right? You might get some penguins, probably get some uh, marine life, microbes. That's about it, <laughs> right? That are naturally occurring. So temperature can definitely influence um, where you find species. Rainfall as well. We're going to talk about net primary productivity here in just a second, which is basically talking about how these factors influence what grows in an ecosystem. And then as we all can sort of uh, pre predict what grows somewhere, the plant life that exists somewhere is going to directly influence what animal life lives there too, because it provides what? Hmm? Energy. Energy, yeah, food. They, they said the food chain, right, or our photosynthesizer. So that's where we're headed with that. So these abiotic factors, like temperature and rainfall, are also influenced by latitude and elevation. What is latitude? Distance from the equator. Yep. So if you look at a globe and you have the lines that are going from pole to pole, that's latitude. Equator and its sort of circa other concentric rings, that's latitude, right? So distance from the equator is going to affect how warm or how cold it is. Remember our Antarctica example? That's about as far from the equator as you can get on the southern hemisphere. So distance from the equator is going to affect temperature. Um, what about elevation? It's more to do with like how. Far above or below sea level. Yeah, how far above or below sea level? How high are you? So when you go up to the top of a tall mountain, is it cooler or hotter than it is at like down here? It's cooler, yeah. So if you go out to uh, the Rockies in the middle of the summer, might you still see snow caps on the tops of some of those mountains? Absolutely. It's like 90 degrees at sea level and it's snowing on top of the mountain. Right? So those types of things are, are all part of biogeography. Okay, so looking at where things are and where, from the equator and also in elevation. Yeah. Yeah. It is largely because the air is thinner. There are other things that, that influence it, like um, the currents, atmospheric currents and things like that. I'm not super strong in meteorology. So I couldn't tell you like this stream pushes this one, but it's all that kind of stuff. But mostly it has to do with the fact that the air is like this. So you have less molecules bumping into one another and it just there's less energy. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Yeah, meteorology, that's uh, interesting, but I have to like read about it. I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, okay, let's see. Other factors in biogeography include inorganic nutrients and soil composition. 
Okay, so where you are in the world and what sort of like rocks made up make up the bedrock underneath you is going to contribute to what type of soil you have. Right? Maybe you have sandy soil. Maybe you have super rich, um, loamy soil. Right? It depends. It depends on where you are geographically, what your soil looks like. Um, what about light penetrance? So we're talking about light penetrance. We're talking about aquatic ecosystems. We haven't talked too much about that yet, but we'll talk more about um, photosynthesis in the water and different types of aquatic ecosystems. We'll look at that in this chapter as well. So what does light penetrance have to do with anything? What does that mean? So I know some of y'all know how to use a second disc. Yeah, isn't that like when you were talking about like the photosynthesis earlier? Yeah. Like, so like pretty much like how much light is we can how deep into the water because certain things need that sunlight in order to photosynthesize. And stuff deeper doesn't get as much sunlight as you need. Yeah. Absolutely. So light penetrance is the photic zone, right? How far down into the water does the light get to go? And what kind of things can affect that? David, what about turbidity? Silpiness, right? When you guys have been looking at your cameras, it's hard to even see a certain distance because there's so much silt in the water. So that can affect how far down light can penetrate. Um, other types of organisms that are in the water called above you, right, can, can uh, affect light penetrance. But we're looking at that too when we start looking at uh, aquatic ecosystems because, like Cheyenne said, there are photosynthetic organisms throughout the water column, throughout the photic zone, and, so, and, and you have to compete basically for that light, right? So we're talking about that as well. That's part of biogeography. Um, let's see. Abiotic factors affect the composition of plant and animal communities. That makes sense. That's just a statement. <laughs> no new information there. Um, and as we have talked about before, Biogeographical uh, components have been influential to bio biogeographical studies, right? Which were influential on early evolutionary thought. And thinking about things like, well, if it takes a really long time for these geographic formations to occur, maybe species adapt slowly too, right? You guys remember that from talking about um, Lyle and Hutt also two years ago. I don't know if I'm the only one who feels like this semester went for two years, but that's what I'm settling on. All right, so terms to know related to biogeography, you've got range, which you're probably familiar with. I have already been using it some. Uh, where a species can be found throughout its lifetime, including areas used during migration and hibernation. And we'll look at some range maps later, so we'll come back to that. But the range is just where it is something. What are the boundaries? How far north, how far south, how far east and west does something occur? It can be cosmopolitan, right, meaning it's everywhere. It could be very, very restricted, have a really small range, right? Um, and if you find something that has a really small, naturally, naturally occurring, very small restricted range, that's called an endemic. So a species that is endemic to some place in particular and found nowhere else, that's how you describe uh, that species as endemic. So something like uh, Cherokee darters, right? Keegan, Michael, where are your Cherokee darters found? Drum Creek, right? They're an Etowah species. It's a federally listed species along with uh, the Etowah darter, which is sort of a cousin, same genus, but they're nowhere else, right? It's super cool that we found one in the creek because they're not, right? They're not found anywhere else. Um, in fact, the southeastern United States, you guys may or may not know this, is one of the highest levels of biodiversity for things like freshwater fish um, and amphibians, which is kind of crazy to think about. But anyway, I digress. That's an endemic. Okay, so range and endemic are just two terms you guys need to know. Um, so even though we're pretty good here in the southeastern US, most unique endemics occur in regions that have been physically separated for millions of years. So there are definitely places that have a lot of cool stuff, way more than the southeastern US, places like Australia. So if you look at the biodiversity of species in Australia, you got a ton of weird stuff that was there and nowhere else. Like what? Any ideas? You guys know what wallabies are? And uh, let's see, what else? Echidnas, right? that, there's a book up here. That's a wallaby, that's an echidna. Um, tons of plant diversity that's found nowhere else. Um, let's see, what else? What's the one that comes from square? You guys know what I'm talking about. Is that wallaby? No, it's not wallaby. It's, um, say it again. Louder. Wombats, yeah. He, he knows what I'm talking about. We'll talk about wombats later, that's weird. And they actually poop in cubes and then they use it for stuff like building things. Very weird. Anyway, 
uh, unique endemics to Australia, that Australia has been physically separated from other land masses for more than 100 million years. Why do you think that means there are more endemic species on Australia than anywhere else? What about that separation? Hold it louder for me. Yeah, they can't migrate. And they've been, so what, ha, what about evolutionary traje trajectories? This, the, the environmental conditions are different, right? There's no connectivity. You're isolated. You're on your own trajectory, right? Evolutionarily speaking. You're, you're well suited to your particular set of, of uh, environmental conditions, but they're different than anywhere else. And there's no gene flow, right? Because of that separation. So you end up with all these weirdos living on this island continent, right? Um, so that's a, a, something to keep in mind as we're tying this all back into what we talked about in the very beginning with regards to um, species evolution. Okay. All right, that's biogeography. Let's talk about net primary productivity. This is key. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give you a preview of the next few slides. Um, I'm going to give you some information about all of these terrestrial biomes. Okay? You don't have to memorize that information. I'll tell you what I want you to be able to do with it. But what is really important, the main thing I'm going to ask you to do with it is to think about the in terms of productivity. Okay, so when we're looking at net primary productivity, this is essentially plant production, photosynthetic organisms at the base of the food chain. Those are your producers. Okay, in I think it's the 46, chapter 46, we'll talk about food chains and food webs. But photosynthetic organisms are at the base of a food chain or a food web. Why? What are photosynthetic organisms doing that heterotrophs can't do? Making, yeah, they're making their own food for energy, right? Can we make our own food? Doesn't matter how hard you try, you can't photosynthesize. You can't chemosynthesize. You gotta eat stuff, right? So these photosynthetic organisms are harnessing energy from where? From the sun. So the sun is that input of energy into just about every ecosystem that we'll talk about. Ultimately, that's where all the energy came from in the in our solar system. Sometimes we'll talk about chemical energy, like from hydrothermal vents. Okay, it's a little bit different, but way back in the beginning, that's where it all came from. Anyway, these fission reactions on the sun. So we're harnessing energy from the sun, turning it into glucose, right, and then breaking that glucose down for ATP energy. Everything else eats this stuff. If you can't get your energy from the sun, you have to get it from chemicals. And those chemicals are the chemicals that are being built by photosynthesizers, right? So we use productivity, primary productivity, as a measure of like how much can an ecosystem support? How much life can an ecosystem support? Because if you don't have high productivity, you don't have a lot of food for everybody else. You guys following what I'm talking about here? So that's why it's important. So primary productivity without the net on it is just talking about plant production. But net primary productivity is how much is uh, available for food. How much of that plant production can we actually eat? Okay. So there's a there's a loss between gross primary productivity, which is GPP over here, minus R, which is um, which one of these? Respiration. There it is. Some glucose used to supply energy to dry cellular processes. What are we talking about here? This plant, this dandelion, okay, is gathering energy from the sun and it's making sugar, right? That is its gross primary production. How much sugar can it make using the energy from the sun to power those synthesis reactions, right? But some of that energy, some of that sugar that this dandelion is making is going to respiration. Right? What is this dandelion doing to waste all of that perfectly good glucose that somebody else can eat? What is respiration? Hmm? Somebody say something? What am I talking about here? Breathing. breathing. We're talking about cellular respiration, right? Breathing at the cellular level. Exchange of what? What do you, when you respire, when your cell, when you do cellular respiration, what are you using? You're exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide, right? Plants are interesting because they do both. 
right? They photosynthesize and they do cellular respiration. So plants also need to use some of that sugar that they made to turn it into ATP because they also need ATP for their cellular process, right? They're using, they're using glucose to make ATP. You guys remember that from bio one? You break those bonds in the glucose and you take that energy and you hand it over to NAD and FAD and you push it out into the electron transport chain and you crank out ATP, right? Everybody's favorite part of bio one, right? Cellular respiration. Love it. I know you. Anyway, whether you loved it or hated it, I know you remember what I'm talking about, right? So there's often sort of this uh, loss of translation, I feel like, between talking about photosynthetic organisms and heterotrophs, where we forget that plants have to do cellular respiration also. So they're making their own food through photosynthesis, but they're also breaking that food down for cellular respiration. So that's where the where, that's where the R comes in. You take the gross amount of glucose that a photosynthetic organism makes, then you subtract how much that plant used for its own energetic needs, its own metabolism. You guys with me? So what is left is net primary productivity. When you guys get a paycheck, let's say you work at a job where you make 10 bucks an hour and you work 40 hours, so your paycheck should be $400, right? Is it? No, why not? taxes, insurance, whatever, right? So $400 is your gross, right? Net, your net is what you end up taking home after they've taken out your taxes and your insurance and whatever else. You guys with me? So your net primary productivity, think about it as like what's left after taxes, okay? Think about respiration in the plant tissue as the taxes, okay? Does that make sense? So net primary productivity is how much is around for food for other organisms. So all that that I just said is in this bullet here, calculated as a total amount of carbon fixed per year minus the amount that is oxidized during cellular respiration. Okay, is that okay? That's a little more terminology heavy, but that's what we just talked about. Um, basically, how much photosynthate is available for building plant tissues after normal metabolic needs are met. So what does that mean, building plant tissue? That is what the plant is doing with the leftover glucose. So it harnesses energy from the sun, it uses that energy to build glucose, and then it uses that glucose to make ATP for itself. And with the glucose molecules that are left over, the other photosynthates, right, because it makes other stuff besides just C6H1206, right, there's other carbon backbones and things that are built into leaves and flowers and everything else that a plant does. And that's what we eat, is the plant tissues that the plant builds with its leftovers after it did cellular respiration. Does that make, make sense? Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Now, when you're calculating net primary productivity, you include above ground biomass. What is biomass? Do you guys know that term? Yeah, how much living tissue is there? Like if you go out and you mow off all the dandelions and you put them in a scale, you're weighing biomass. Yeah. They do, but they're not easily available for most organisms to eat. So that's why ecologists don't measure. So either they are hard to get to or they're not terribly appealing. There are exceptions like potatoes or carrots, right? So stuff will eat some roots, but in general, we don't include roots in the county so it's above ground biomass only. For other reasons, as well as food, plants are also gonna um, provide habitat. Right, so if you're using this as a baseline measure of describing biomes, which is what we're doing with this, you can talk about, mostly you're talking about this chemical relationship, but you also have to think about if there's food and habitat, you have increased biodiversity as well. So if you look at something like a rainforest, there's a whole lot more food, but there's also a lot more habitat than if you look at something like the Arctic tundra, yes? If Antarctica is on the South Pole, where's the Arctic? North Pole, yeah. We'll talk about those as we're going forward. Okay, highly productive biomes, biomes that we classify as highly productive are gonna have high levels of above ground biomass or high net primary productivity, okay? Now, when we start looking at the biomes, that's what we're talking about. So this is a pretty cool map that shows you where each of these biomes is located. 
Okay, uh, and it's color coded, so you can spend some time sort of looking at it and thinking through it. Um, a good example would be let's look at the green one. So, what does the green on the map uh, represent? Tropical forest. Where do you see it in terms of latitude? Mostly around the equator, right? So, you're talking about tropical wet forests, mostly, right? Super high productivity. Why? Yeah, consistent rainfall, consistent temperature, right? Seasonality is not really a thing <laughs> at the equator. It basically stays warm and moist all the time, right? So you have incredibly efficient growing conditions, which we'll talk about on the next slide, um, which means you get a lot of plant growth, which means you have a lot of food, which means you have a lot of habitat, which means you have a lot to support a ton of species, right? So biodiversity in the tropics is incredibly hot, immeasurably hot, as far as number of species. Um, what about the orange, the, like this orange, the tundra? Where is that? Hmm? Or this from the equator in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So this is Arctic. Um, what do you think happens to net primary productivity at the poles? Drops, yep. So what I want you guys to be able to do with this is think about this, okay? And this is really a quote. I can't remember if I got it in the textbook or some other source, but I like it, um, which is why it's in brackets. This is a direct quote. I did not write this, and it's wordy, but I love the way it's, it's put down. So let's just read through it, and then we'll talk about how it uh, relates to what we're talking about. Annual biomass production is directly related to the abiotic components of the environment. So we're talking about ecosystem, right? Abiotic. Environments with the greatest amount of biomass have conditions in which photosynthesis, plant growth, and the resulting net primary productivity are optimized. What does optimized mean? Say again? Like the best condition. Best condition. Optimal, right? Most desirable. The climate of these areas is warm and wet. Okay, so we're talking about largely the tropics as a great example of that. Here's why. Okay, photosynthesis can proceed at a high rate. Enzymes can work most efficiently. Do you guys remember? This is also from Bio One. Uh, optimal temperature, pH, and um, there's one other factor I think you guys explored in lab, maybe. Uh, sorry? Maybe. I can't remember what you guys do in that lab. I'm thinking of a particular lab. I'm not even sure if you guys do it in one of anymore. But when you're talking about optimal uh, conditions for enzymes, you're talking about what. Um, Requirements does that enzyme have? What do enzymes do? You guys remember? Yeah, they catalyze chemical reactions. They speed them up, they make them happen fast enough to sustain life. In some instances, they wouldn't happen at all without an enzyme. So enzymes are catalysts. Do you remember what macromolecule they're mostly made of? Protein, right? And proteins are super picky about environmental conditions. They like a very narrow range of temperature. Outside of that range, if it gets too hot, you can even denature the protein. Or you can cook it, it won't work anymore. If it's too cold, what happens to the rate of reaction if it gets too cold? You guys think? Slow it down, right? So enzymes are super picky about temperature. We're super picky about pH. They have lots of really, really tight value ranges for uh, efficiency of enzymes. It's warm, like 75, and there's water everywhere. That is optimal temperature and uh, rainfall for these enzymes to work efficiently. So you're cranking out photosynthesis because you have the perfect conditions to do so. Now, if you go to the desert, what changes? With, in, with regards to those um, environmental impacts on enzyme function, what do you think? Hmm? Less water by a lot, right? And it can be super hot and it can be super cold. So you're not, the, it's not that you're excluding the enzymes from working at all, but you're outside of that optimum range of efficiency. So you crank down the rate of photosynthesis, photosynthesis that you can do. Make sense? All right, so that's what we're talking about here. Photosynthesis in these warm, wet climates can proceed at a high rate. Enzymes work most efficiently. Stomata can remain open. Do you guys remember stomata? What are stomata? Like little anaerobic little opening, still moving, or then I get it and I don't get water or migrate the clothes. 
Yeah, where are they? On the leaves. On the leaves, yeah, those pores, right? The controlled, regulated open and closing of those pores that let water, because they're, they're there to allow for gas exchange, but if they're open, water can escape, right? Transpiration occurs. So when it's hot and dry, they close it. So if you're in a wet, warm atmosphere, um, stomata can remain open without the risk of excessive transpiration. And together, these factors lead to maximal amount of carbon dioxide moving into the plant, because the stomates are open, right? Resulting in high biomass production because CO2 is the substrate for photosynthesis, right? It's the piece that you need to start putting those sugars together. The above ground biomass produces several important resources for other living things, including habitat. This like summer summarizes everything you need to know about net primary productivity. So I like that passage. Okay, so what I want you guys to think about going forward is putting this map which is net primary productivity from white being low to dark green being high, right? Look at this map and look at this map and see what connections you can make, okay? That's what I'm gonna ask of you. So when we look through the next few slides, um, I'm not even gonna lecture on these slides because I don't care if you know this stuff. Okay? I don't need you to tell me uh, the exact like frequency of rainfall in the savanna. Okay? I don't care about that. But I do, I did leave these slides in here because if you want to look through them, it may help you put some context to this map, okay, where they're found, characteristics. So on your study guide, you'll actually see where it says you don't have to know all the information about all of these different uh, terrestrial biomes, but I do want you to know the general characteristics of each one, okay? So if I can ask you a question, if I ask you a question about where on the earth it's found. So basically what I would do would you be to use it in an, in an example of a question. So I may talk about in the chaparral, blah, 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 right? If you have some familiarity with the conditions in the chaparral, you'll be better equipped to answer the question that I'm throwing at. Does that make sense? I'm not gonna ask you to give me latitude uh, in degrees of where you find the desert. Okay, I won't, I, that's not the kind of specific type of question I would ask you, but I would use these in terms of context. So general characteristics, okay, of each of those terrestrial biomes, mostly with regard to that primary productivity and what it means to be where you are, okay? So if I ask you about something like um, the desert and where that's found or changes in elevation related to, you know, mountains versus uh, low mountains and stuff like that, okay? There, cool. All right, um, that's as far as I was hoping to get today. And we're, we're at 1208. So I think I'll wait and do a pot of fire on Wednesday. And then we'll just talk about these uh, briefly. And then we'll talk about zones of the ocean a little bit. Talk about coral reefs for a second, estuaries, freshwater, and wetlands. And that's it for this first chapter. So we're almost done already with chapter 44, since it's just an intro anyway. That's good. And then we'll go right into 45, uh, which is population and community technology, which is fun. That's where the graphs come in. You guys are going to love it. Questions? What do you think so far? Ecology seems okay, right? It's like friendlier. There's not so many terms like osteoctes and sarcopterygii and stuff like that, right? The language is actually like English and not silence for the most part. 